Hello, all you textual deviants, and welcome to another episode of Texting with me, Tomek, in St. Petersburg. And with me, Mark Will, in Taipei. Today's episode, we'll be tackling a rather dark, uh, mercurial, perhaps self-indulgent, directorial debut by Charlie Kaufman in the film Synecdoche, New York. This is a 2008 film that stars Philip Seymour Hoffman as an ailing theater director who works on an increasingly elaborate stage production and whose extreme commitment to realism begins to blur the boundaries between fiction and reality. So obviously I'm heavily borrowing there from Wikipedia, but uh, that's a little bit of backstory. Uh, and the reason we've elected to take on this film is because it was another request by a very kind listener and friend, Steve Wasserman. Steve is a therapist based in New York. What? Based in London. <laughs> I'm sorry. And uh, this is a film that speaks to him. And as we mentioned, Steve, we should also plug his podcast, which is the Poetry Cones. Cone K-O-A-N. Mark uh, insists on a different pronunciation. So, which uh, is the Japanese and American pronunciation. Uh, but it's a great podcast that uh, masterfully deals with poetry, therapy, life, cannabis, and uh, yeah, definitely worth checking out on Apple Podcasts, on Spotify, or wherever you choose to download your favorite pods. So it's a it's an ambitious film. It's a difficult film to watch, um, but uh, we do recommend it. And you'll probably get more out of this particular episode, listener, if you take the time to listen or to watch the film either prior or post listening. So Mark, do you want to jump in and just deal with the etymology of the title? Uh, well, uh, the neck to key, I guess that's the part you, you want to, enjoy, yeah. right? Not the mm -hmm. short part, but that's interesting too, because it's, uh, sure. I mean, much of the film is set in Schenectady, New York. So it, the title is a play on that particular city, but, uh, what is, what is, Synecdoche. Uh, first of all, that that word actually came up in season one when we were talking about Umberto Eco's Ur fascism. Do you remember that? Vaguely. I mean, I remember that we had uh, kind of, well, I, I had learned how to pronounce it on that episode. Okay. So now it yeah. just rattles off the tongue anytime I, I roll. Yeah. Well, uh, in that essay, Echo says the word fascism became a synecdoche, that is, a word that could be used for different totalitarian movements. So a synecdoche is a substitution of the part for the whole or the whole for the part. So in this case, in the Echo case, we have all of these different totalitarian movements that have elements of the whole of fascism, right? But they're all called fascism. So fascism has, the word has become a synecdoche for uh, various movements which might have elements of fascism. In that essay, you'll recall, he highlighted, what was it, 14 elements of, was it 14, I think? 14 elements of what he called Ur fascism or like, you know, proto-fascism, the beginning of fascism. So the, the rhetorical figure of synecdoche is a substitution of the part for the whole or the whole for the part. When I learned this term as a student of literature, the example that uh, was given to me was Dylan Thomas's poem, The Hand That Felled, or sorry, The Hand That Signed the Paper Felled a City. So it's about some politician presumably signing, you know, a peace document or a, a 
you know, a, the terms of surrender or something like that. So the hand, the part, substitutes for the whole person, you mm -hmm. know, the, poli the politician making the decision. So that's an example of synecdoche in, in which a uh, part substitutes for whole. And synecdoche itself is a kind of what's called metonymy. And metonymy is a kind of metaphor, but there is an association. There, there's like a proximity between the word or image used and the thing referred to. So the, the best example of that might be something like the pen is mightier than the sword, right? So the pen is closely associated with writing and the sword is associated with whatever fighting violence war you know so writing or creative expression or whatever you want to say is mightier than you know might violence <clears throat> war except in present-day russia <laughs> Well, and many other places. <laughs> that that might be wishful thinking that uh that uh sentence with two examples of metonymy. But met the the word metonymy is also interesting because the prefix is actually meta. Mm -hmm. Uh and this is a very meta uh movie as right. as I'm sure we'll discuss. And meta yeah. means a lot of things in Greek, but one, one of the meanings is beyond. Um, and, and so often when we talk about something being meta in the arts, it's like, it's something about something else. Right. 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 Yeah. So, so here in this film, we have a play about a play, uh, which is also about real life, I guess you could say. So, we have a movie about a play about a play mm -hmm. about life itself. Yeah. So, uh, so why, thought, why is it, why is that, why is that chosen as the title though? Synecdoche, New York. I mean, okay. Yes, there is mention of Schenectady, New York, and there's a kind of, paranomasia going on there but but why what is what how does the film exemplify that that rhetorical figure of the synecdoche what part is substituting for what whole or what whole is substituting for what part i mean maybe i'm off on this but it seems like the film is trying to argue that this character is all of us, right? So in that sense, he represents humanity and the play then takes on other real characters. So even if maybe you can't find yourself in the, the narrator, um, not the narrator, but uh, in Caden's character, you might find yourself in another character or and everyone is everyone so that's you experience exactly everybody and, yeah. yeah so that is but such I think, a that is such a beautiful line everyone is everyone you know yeah for me it was a bit trite <laughs> and also i found that claim uh too lofty and yeah, I maybe it's time now just to jump into how I felt about the film and you can maybe give your more visceral reaction before we go heavy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So love you, Steve, but I didn't really like this film. Uh I can appreciate it as a incredibly intricate craft that had massive amount of attention paid to every detail, particularly in the editing process, um, the constant shifting between reality and more of a surreal 
experience. Clearly a huge endeavor to to create a film like this. And so in that sense, of course, I, I respect the, the effort and the brilliance that it required, but I didn't take to the character and I just found it a mixture of indulgent and excessively pessimistic and just generally depressing. So that's, I guess, as, as I say that I'm, you know, criticizing my own opinion to a certain extent. So there's what the film has going for it is that it invites dialogue and it pushes us to think. And, and I think that the discussion we're hoping to have now, which I assume will be fruitful, will be a kind of counter to my initial criticism, because it will show that the film has been effective in, in pushing us to grapple with topics like death and decay. Uh, but I can't say that I enjoyed the experience of watching it. And I guess I just consider myself like, I just can't relate to the heaviness literally and metaphorically of the main character. Uh, so, so when he's positing to speak for all of us, I'm just kind of thinking, dude, this dude is not really that self-critical. He takes himself too seriously. I mean, I'm, I'm repeating myself to some extent now, but, but even, and, and assuming this, this represents Kaufman and his own inner life and inner demons, Again, it's like bit, taking yourself a bit too seriously or, or just not, he hasn't found the joie de vivre, you know? I think I mispronounced that, but, but yeah, why, why be so bogged down, I guess is my question. Like, of course, if, we, if he's suffering from a mental illness, that's one thing, right? If the chemicals are imbalanced, I mean, I can empathize with stuff like that. But if this is just like the phys philosophical conclusion that this guy's reached that life is shit and that I'm dying. Well, that interpretation of life is not, doesn't resonate with me and isn't, isn't enticing. And it doesn't even have, sorry to like rant. I'll just go to a few more seconds, but it doesn't even have that quality of like, a, of a Beckett where you get a kind of depressing theme, but you definitely speaks to me like, yes, that is life. This doesn't feel like life. So it didn't have that cathartic quality that tragedy can have it just was a bit more like uh like, like what's what's your problem dude so i said a few things there what do you think about some of that yeah well i mean i disagree that there's no catharsis i think the fact that uh this film was made and this story was told that in itself has a cathartic effect on me. I'm glad that someone attempted to tell the brutal truth, you know, as, as the character, the director says he's, he's aiming to do. And yeah, it, you could but say is that the brutal truth as he sees it. I mean, uh, it's certainly a part of the brutal truth. Uh, if we're, if we're talking, I don't know specifically about death since you, you mentioned that several times and that was the part that maybe you found the most depressing and it is heavy. Yeah. I mean, I, uh, paused it a couple of times throughout and took breaks, not, not only because of the, the content, but I was, I was doing other things, you know, I didn't watch it all in one sitting, but, but at times I, you know, uh did take breaks because i was feeling overwhelmed but but also i would i would uh you know replay certain bits because they were so i i think you're missing a lot of the humor in this i mean it's it's hilarious there's a lot of really uh uproariously funny moments in it so I, I don't see it all as doom and gloom at all, you know? Well, let's come back to your initial 
response, which was that death is brutal. You know, I would take issue with that. Uh, also, well, I, I, no, no, I didn't say that. He said the brutal truth is not just about death. I mean, you say uh, but death, how is that's that not all there is, yeah. but death is part of life, you know? Death sure, and life but I'm, are... I'm saying when I say it's depressing, that's not the part that puts me off, but it's depressing without enough cause. You know, it's like I'm I'm ready to be depressed in a movie that portrays the horrors of war, you know, mm -hmm. or or some and if and again, this his suffering his suffering is his suffering. He can't probably control it and he's speaking his truth. But uh Yeah, I guess I, I just couldn't relate to his emotional experience of life. So what was, I guess we're already jumping into just this, a discussion of, of Caden Cotard, but I guess. Well, we, let's talk it's about him. To... Let's, let's start there. Let's start there. So the name is completely fascinating, right? Mm -hmm. The, the surname in particular, uh, I didn't know this, but, um, uh, when re uh, doing research for the show, I learned about Cotard syndrome, mm -hmm. which is sometimes called walking corpse syndrome. This is a thing, right? This is a condition, right. a disease people have. They think people who have this condition think they are actually dead. They think they don't exist. They or think they, initially they think they're rotting. They think they're they... rotting. They're decaying. So it's like the most extreme form of hypochondria. And, uh, having had some uh hype, some bouts of hypochondria myself or having had certain hypochondriac tendencies in my life um i can see how one can go down that rabbit hole of obsession you know mm -hmm. i can i can relate to that in a way there's actually a very funny uh woody allen movie that deals with the, with the same thing like he the woody allen character what is it is it hannah and her sisters i think it is he's obsessed with death too and uh he think he's convinced he has cancer and uh you know then he goes to a marx brothers movie just uh one afternoon he goes to a matinee and he snaps out of it because he, he just instantly recognizes the joy of life, uh, as you alluded to, uh, in an instant. And, and I think, uh, you know, someone who has this deep depression could possibly experience the same thing. And the, the act of, creating something like this is in itself cathartic, you know, and that is, that is what gives purpose to the otherwise meaningless life. It's, it's what, um, a particular psychologist whose name I can't remember now called an immortality project, right? We know that our, corporeal bodies will decay and perish and die but we we want to do something to uh allow our existence to have meaning sure and we do that by by uh devoting ourselves to an immortality project maybe it's a you know Maybe it's a movie, maybe it's a play about a play, maybe it's a podcast, maybe it's books or music or any number of things, you know. Like the, this psychologist mentions that Freud's uh, immortality project was uh, his his theories, right? Like he devoted himself, even though he, he uh, claimed to be an atheist, he, he like devoted himself to a higher cause, namely the propagation of his own theories and system of thought. 
Yeah, so... All, all of which is by way of saying I didn't f- find it to be the downer that that you did. I mean, I, I enjoyed it very much. Now, I, so, not, can, there, there, I did have reservations. You know, I, too, felt at times it was self-indulgent. You know, like, it, it was funny how he said, I'm thinking of calling it simulacrum. And then I believe it's the Michelle Williams character who's an actress that he eventually marries, right? Um, right. And, and we can talk about the way time is compressed, you know, in, in this film. That, that's when I realized, oh, this is this is not meant to be straight realism. I mean, of course, there were clues with the with that stalker guy that we would see at random times. And the house times, on but, fire. Yeah, and then and then the house on fire. I, at first, I thought, oh, is this a dream? And then I realized, no, this is actually like part of the narrative. So, okay, we're in a surreal world. And then the way that time was compressed, right? Like we're we're in one scene and then in the next scene is 20 years later or something like that. But um, where was I going with this? I don't even Can we come back saying. to Caden? So... Remind you, me what I was talking about, though. There's a point that I don't want to. Uh, <laughs> I don't want to lose the thread of this. Maybe that's well, what really happened. I mean, initially you were you you were def- defending the idea that it's not depressing. Okay. No. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I I remember what I was going to say. I said yes. I I do feel that. I feel that it's triumphant, you know, in a way. But right, as again, this person, as and I art. admire it, but not without, not without reservation. You know, there is that self indulgence. Like the Caden character says, "Oh, I'm thinking of calling it simulacrum." And then the Michelle Williams character, the actress that becomes his wife, says, "I don't even know what that means." So it's it, it's like kaufman the scriptwriter, takes the piss out of himself there you know right which I, I love that i think that's brilliant and and so he's so even when he knows he's being self-indulgent he's he's h- highly conscious of that you know so that to me that excuses it and is not as uh, as unforgivable an aesthetic crime as you seem to think it is or i don't no, I mean, know i don't know if it's an aesthetic uh solecism or whatever but it's a, but it bothers you you know you don't like it <laughs> what i'm trying to say is that i feel like the film is as effective in a way as the main character is relatable right so you initially addressed one aspect which is his obsession with death and you said you can empathize because of your own hypochondria and if it was limited to that i would agree but if we think about just how tyrannical his artistic vision then later appears to be, you know, when he's addressing this room of actors and he's saying, you're all going to die and I'm going to die. And it's like he's trying to assert that this is the critical truth, right? Or then when he has this soliloquy about the brutal truth, which you alluded to, as if truth is brutal, that's one thing, which I take issue with. And then the second, when he comes out with these post-it notes, you know, insisting that each actor take on a different brutal reality, whether it's what, you just were raped. You were raped last night. (laughs) Yeah. Or your lover appears like a stranger. You think you might be gay. Yeah, so all these you know, fairly nightmare situations, or at least situations wrought with pain. And, but, but my question is that why portray life in that way when life is so much more than that? If that's, again, if that's his truth, but then to kind of impose it on other people and yeah, he seems just rather odious as a, as a character. And that's my point. So, and then he's, then he's going to claim to be every man, you know, 
that's what I don't I don't get. What do you think about that? I don't know when he claimed to be every man. He said everyone is everyone. He's not he's not saying I mean well, also he didn't say that, you know, that was the earpiece. Okay. Just saying okay. that was the earpiece, which is the earpiece is Ellen. Right. The Diane Weiss character. But I'm pretty sure I could be wrong about but, exactly. I, I, but, that might be right, but she is doing that with his blessing, right? He agreed to. Yeah, it is Mills. It's it's the character Millicent Weems who's okay. But played, he sorry agreed. To yeah, he agreed to give her the authority. So you could say that on some level he knew that's where she was going to take it, and and um, he agreed to basically switch identities with her, right? Like he becomes the the cleaning woman and she becomes the director. So um, I, I think even though he may not have been the one to say that line, he would endorse that point of view. Sure, sure. So that's not, that's not the same thing as saying, or as him saying, I'm every man. I mean, he's saying every one is every man everyone is everyone you know the the issue of identity which uh as we may have discussed before uh is always fluid in my personal dreams like when i dream you know identities of dream characters including myself are not always clear right like i think i'm talking to one person or interacting with one person and then that person becomes someone else and this this certainly has a very dreamlike surreal quality you know like like fellini's eight and a half which uh i i read uh was often referred to in in uh reviews of this film you know mm -hmm. uh, eight and a half is the classic movie about a movie so again as a, that's what made me think okay th so this is a movie about a play about a play mm. you know and it's and they're all of course you know meta and they're all uh attempting to allegorize life itself in some way and, and you know I, I was reminded of other films too the the Taglines for these movies are interesting, right? Like if you look them up, Synecdoche, New York is described as a postmodern. That's the part I find pretentious, you know. That's where you get terms like simulacrum. Like he 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 wanted to throw in some French lit crit terminology, you know, to to prove his cleverness. But then as I say, he undermines himself by having another character say, I don't know what that means. But it's called a postmodern psychological drama film, right? But then one of his other movies, which we both thought of as we were watching this, we texted each other about this. As I'm watching, I'm thinking, oh, this is like that movie I saw recently on, ne on Netflix. I'm thinking of ending things. And then I looked that up. It's by Charlie Kaufman. Wow. Which amazing. I loved, by the way. You like that, you like that film. better, yeah. yeah. Well, that one, that one is described as a surrealist psychological thriller. Could the same label be applied to this film? Maybe not thriller, but surrealist and psychological for sure. And then um, I, I was reminded of another movie by Aronofsky. And I want to I jump in really quickly, if you don't mind, on the genre discussion, because mm -hmm. I think it's worth mentioning that you know, I'm I'm kind of complaining about how oppressive this main character is, and and why that why that's so off putting for me. But the actual origin story for this film is that uh, Sony approached Kaufman and Spike Jones about making a horror film, and uh, they decided to focus on things that they found frightening in real life rather than typical horror film tropes. So and it is. While, it's a psychological horror film. Yeah, and I think if I see it, my point is if I see it as a horror film, 
then maybe it's appropriate that the main character is like a horror figure in a way, right? An ex like an exaggerated hyperbolic example of of someone suffering rather than and why do people I why do people with. why do people like horror films why do people like you know that genre of literature because they do get some sort of cathartic release when they have the shit scared out of them that in itself is cathartic and again i'm i, I want to mention this other film that i think is part of the same genre I just lost your video feed. Are you still there? Part of the same uh, genre uh, is Aronofsky's mother with uh, an exclamation point. Okay, I seem to have lost Tomek here.